All right, guys, so we're here to go over the study guide for section 1.3 on hearing and the ear. And so question one, explain how sound travels through the air. So it's a mechanical wave, which means it has to move matter. That's why sound can't travel through space because space is a vacuum. There's a lack of matter. And so uh, in you know, normal circumstances, we're talking or making sounds that air molecules have to carry. So air molecules get pushed by sound waves as they travel towards your eardrum. Oops. Okay, next you were supposed to draw a picture of a sound wave and you were supposed to label some parts like the amplitude and the frequency and describe how these terms relate to how a person would hear this sound wave. So wavelength is going to be the distance between two similar points on two different waves. So like we call, call the tops of the waves the crests. So from crest to crest would be one way that you can measure, or you could do it from um, the trough to the next trough. In this case, they chose kind of the middle where the crest meets the baseline to the crest meeting the baseline, and they showed that as wavelength. But it's going to be the number of waves that pass a specific point in a given amount of time. And the higher the frequency, the higher the pitch or the higher the sound. So more of these waves in like a one second interval gives you a higher pitch than fewer of those waves would in one second intervals. Amplitude is how high or the wave goes or how far away from the baseline it goes. And so the taller the crest or the lower the troughs, um, the louder the sound is going to be. Okay, so big tall waves mean you got a loud sound, smaller waves around the baseline would be a lower sound, less volume. Okay, and then you were supposed to draw separate waves to represent differences in these sounds. So it said to draw a high pitch and a low pitch sound. So in this case, uh, of these four drawings, the highest pitch would be this one because it has the most waves in the same amount of time if we're assuming that the baseline is for all of these waves is the same. Okay, so this would be the highest pitch sound. Um, low pitch, this would be the lowest pitch because we don't even see a complete wave here. Loud sounds would be have higher amplitudes, so this is going to be a high, I'm sorry, a louder sound, and this one's going to be a lower sound. Of lower volume sound. All right, this is part of lesson 1.3.1 .1, uh, that you specifically had to do as part of your notes. So really all you had to do was copy this. It says, describe the pathway of sound from the time a sound is generated to the time our brain registers the sound. So first the pinna is going to funnel the ear to the auditory canal and the auditory canal is going to move it to the eardrum or tympanic membrane and make it start wiggling. So the sound hits the eardrum and the eardrum starts to vibrate. The tympanic membrane is attached to that first ossicle called the malleus or hammer. And so that's going to make the malleus start moving. And the malleus bumps against the anvil or incus. And the incus um, is going to bump into the stapes and make it start moving. And the stapes is attached to the cochlea at a spot called the oval window. And so when the oval window is being tapped on by the stirrup, it causes the cochlea and the fluid inside of it to move. And so the, the hairs inside the cochlea are stirred by the movement of that fluid. The fluid's called endolymph. And um, that's gonna, the hairs are attached to nerves that are attached to the cochlear nerve, which joins with the auditory nerve, which goes to the temporal lobe, not lob, of the brain. Okay, so if we were to follow the pathway of sound, we're, the sound enters through the pinna, the pinna funnels the sound through the external auditory canal or just ear canal. Here we can see the eardrum or tympanic membrane is going to start wiggling, then that will make the malleus, which is attached to it, start wiggling, then the incus, then the stapes, and again the stapes is attached to the oval window on the cochlea. That causes the fluid inside the cochlea to wiggle and move, and that moves the hairs that are inside there. That stimulates the nerves the hairs are attached to that go to the cochlear nerve, auditory nerve, and then to the temporal lobe of the brain. All right, so yeah, this is kind of a straight line. All right, it says to study a diagram of the ear and be able to identify the following structures. 
uh, ignore where it says go over the crossword puzzle. We didn't do, th uh, do that. Or if you did, you can go over it. Um, but you didn't necessarily, depending on what semester you're watching this in, I may or may not have had you do a crossword puzzle. Okay, but just go over and know the parts of the ear. Uh, most ear infections, the fancy word for an ear infection or term is otitis media. And media tells you it's happening in the middle ear. So most infections occur in the middle ear. And this is because material from the throat is able to move through the eustachian tube into the middle ear. If we go back and look at this picture without the arrow in the way, here's the eustachian tube. It leads to the throat. And you can see it's contiguous with the middle ear, which is supposed to be filled with air. So if we get some bacteria from the throat to move up the eustachian tube and into the middle ear, that might cause white blood cells to, to invade the area and they'll start um, the inflammation process. And that's how we end up with fluid. And as the white blood cells start killing bacteria and stuff, uh, they die off and they become pus. And so we could get pussy accumulation in the middle ear because of that. And that causes the... Um, uh, that causes the conductive hearing loss that we sometimes see with ear infections. And that's reversible or should be. Okay, what are signs and symptoms? Well, if you have a verbal patient, they're going to tell you that they have pain in their ear. They'll report that their hearing is muffled in that ear. If you have a toddler, a nonverbal person, um, such as someone with who is nonverbal autistic, uh, you might see them pulling or holding their ear and some crying. And then when you look at the eardrum, uh, go through the ear canal and look at the eardrum through the otoscope, you'll see that it's probably uh, bulging toward you as the viewer. And that would indicate that you've got fluid buildup back there. And you'll also see inflamed blood vessels. Uh, sensory neural hear hearing loss means that nerves have been affected, that you've lost hearing because there's a... Uh, nerve damage, there's temporal lobe damage, uh, there's auditory nerve damage, there's some, some neural material has been damaged. Conductive means something that's not wiggling that should be wiggling, whether that be the eardrum because maybe it's punctured or maybe it's uh, got too much tension because of uh, an ear infection and fluid buildup behind it. Um, it could be that the bones, we'll call it the little ossicles, uh, you, there are some conditions in which they don't wiggle properly. Um, so, for instance, otosclerosis would, could keep those bones from wiggling correctly. Um, but something's not wiggling that's supposed to wiggle, and that's conductive hearing loss. Conductive hearing loss uh, sometimes can be reversible. Sensory neural cannot. Okay, and you're supposed to go over all the little scenarios, all the little patients that you guys did presentations on, on the 1.3.1 resource sheet. And also recall that we matched up the patients and their descriptions to the different audiograms. And that's something that's for a little bit later, but yeah, you need to know that. Uh, be able to discuss things like the presbycusis, the otosclerosis, the Meniere's disease that we saw in these different patients. Okay, so uh, here I gave you a new patient that we hadn't seen on any of our others. We see this 36-year-old woman who's got bleeding out of her right ear. Uh, we're cleaning her ears with a cotton, or she was cleaning her ears with a cotton swab and apparently accidentally punctured her eardrum. So when you flush the ear with saline, she reports that she can taste the salt solution in her throat. So she's... Uh, salt water that you're trying to lavage means to rinse out. Um, so you're trying to put saline in there to rinse out blood and stuff that from the bleeding. And she says she's tasting it in her throat. On observation with the otoscope, you find that jagged perforation of the tympanic membrane. And she says that sounds are muffled, which that would be conductive hearing loss because the eardrum can no longer wiggle correctly. Why is the patient able to taste the saline lavage? Well, that's because the eustachian tube connects the middle ear to the throat. So if you've got saline leaking through that perforated eardrum from the ear canal, she, she is going to taste it. 
And again, her hearing loss would be conductive because again, the eardrum is perforated and it's not able to wiggle the way it's supposed to. She hasn't damaged any nerves for, that are associated with hearing in this. She's just damaged things that are supposed to wiggle. Okay, so that is 1.3.1. Have a good one.